Hello everybody, welcome to another video. Today is the 20th of June. Today we'll be discussing the Zaporozhye fronts, but also the Marinka and Bakhmut fronts respectively. So before I begin, I just want to say that now that I'm done with school, my finals are all over, I'm aiming to do a video every single day now for the entirety of the summer. I also plan to use my Twitter account more actively, so if you're interested in um, reading what I write, because I'm going to be doing some pretty interesting Twitter threads about Ukraine, and so if you're interested in that stuff, then give me a follow. I'm also going to be more active in my Discord server, so if you're interested in talking to me there, just uh, join the link in the description. But anyway, let's begin with the actual updates, starting off with Piatikatki, where we have a lot of conflicting reports. Some saying that it's under Russian control, under Ukrainian control, gray zone. I believe that it's more so under the Ukrainian sphere of influence, the area of Piatikatki and Lopkove and the surrounding areas, but it's not fully under their control. They don't have a solid control over there, at least for now. But just as an update from my last video about this town, since then there have been reports that came in from smaller Russian telegram channels such as Rovenkor Z, which is pretty small channel, but what they were claiming is that the deputy commander of this unit, this unit which is a part of the Russian 429th Regiment, which is a part of the 19th Motor Rifle Division, this um, regiment, it includes the Storm of Sisha Battalion, so the deputy commander of this Storm of Sisha Battalion, he was allegedly killed along with most of his men that were encircled in the town of Piatikatki, and that size of that battalion, the Storm of Sisha Battalion, is about 300 men. So then the implication is that those 300 men refused to surrender, and then, you know, either got killed or taken prisoner or something in the ensuing battles. Now, the thing is, there isn't any concrete evidence that an entire battalion was encircled and destroyed in this area. We still haven't seen videos of that many casualties. What we did see was a video from the 128th Separate Mountain Assault Brigade, which, if you recall, fought in Kherson. They also fought in Bakhmut and Solidar for a certain period of time. But now they've been moved into the Zaporozhye Offensive, so they're very experienced. They released a video from this area. I think this is the geolocation. Um, I don't have the geolocation, actually. But they were raising their flag, and they were stepping on the Storm of Sisha Battalion flag which does at least indicate that Storm of Sisha had a presence in this area and that they at least lost possession of one flag, but still, the claim of 300 men being surrounded in a singular town like this, in a pretty small town, that is a pretty big accusation. And so, we don't really have enough footage to validate that. The Storm of Sisha uh, battalion, it's made up of ethnic Ossetians from South Ossetia, which is a breakaway and it's self-proclaimed state of Georgia. So if you uh, want to see where that's located, it's located around here. South Ossetia is located, you know, in the not in the northern part of Georgia, because in the north west you have Abkhazia, which is another self-proclaimed state that is not under Georgia's jurisdiction, but you know, Georgia recognizes it as such, and most of the international community and countries recognize it as such. But then you have Abkhazia, and then you have South Ossetia around here. And so Russia um, is pretty friendly with both of these countries, or self-proclaimed countries. And so there are some volunteers from both of them, both Abkhazia and South Ossetia, that are fighting in the war in Ukraine. And so that is pretty interesting. And so they are integrated into the Russian regular army, but usually they're within their own units, within larger subdivisions. But anyway, the point is, of the Russian sources, they also claimed that the 429th Regiment, which as I said before, includes these South Ossetians, that they were able to regroup and that they were able to eventually retake the town of Piatikatki, and that's not actually that unrealistic because we received reports from both sides that there was a lot of back and forth fighting in this direction over the past two days. Because, you know, this is a gray zone. Not a singular unit has control over this plot of land because it is being fought over every day. You have a new column pushing in from one direction to the other. And so it is sort of par for the course that's going to trade hands during the fighting. 
because of how contested it really is. But then we got this video released by the Stormless Tisha Battalion containing about 16 men from what I counted and they said that the rumors of them being surrounded and destroyed were all false and then the proof is that they were standing there. But they were standing in the forest and only having 16 people it doesn't account for the other 284 men that supposedly died. Of course, we can't confirm that, but we didn't see any of them on video yet, so we don't know what's their status. But, you know, the Osisha Battalion, when it was first organized and sent to the front line, it had about 50 vehicles, such as T-72s, BMP-2s. It also had a Katsia self-propelled howitzers. So it was certainly armed and given some pretty good Russian equipment. And so that's part of why they were fighting on the front line in the first place. But also, we didn't really see any of that equipment in the footage, probably because it's in the forest. But, you know, there's also the implication that they may have been forced to retreat into the forest and that not everybody made it out of the town of Piatikatki in time. Because, you know, here's a town, and then where would the forest be? Would it be this forest? Would it be one further south? I don't know. But anyway, let's move on to the situation a bit further to the east, which is where Russians were actually able to make some gains, which is pretty interesting. In this area, the Russians were initially, um, they initially lost control over some of the fields in this direction. I'll show what the front lines looked like before I made the updates. It looked something like this. Um, something like this, actually. So the Ukrainians, they had control over this Valka Uspenivska nature reserve and over the adjacent fields and tree lines and maybe there are some trenches just not that visible and so they had control over this piece of land in between Novodanilivka and Robotinia and it was always the goal to reach Robotinia and sort of bypass the Russian fortifications in this area which are mainly built in between Kopani and Robotinia and so they want to, the Ukrainians, they want to push through this highway, reach the town, and then, you know, push even deeper in and begin to actually probe the first main Russian lines of defense, which are, you know, 10 kilometers to the south, as you can see over here, like with this one. So they did this by beginning to, you know, send their armored columns and all that into these open fields in the nature reserves but the russians they were able to stop this in the first week of the offensive and since then they've been able to gradually retake these positions and now this is the new status of the front line but yeah that's really about if for zaporozhia let's move on to the situation around marinka which is pretty interesting so in marinka my map i have to admit was a bit incorrect because there is a fortified area to the south of Marinka, this fortified area over here. And it was under Ukrainian control for all these months, but I had it under Russian control, so I apologize for that. It's called Zverinets. That's the name of the fortified area. It's about 211 meters above sea level. And so in comparison to other areas around Donetsk, it is pretty high. The entire Donetsk Ridge is obviously pretty high and above sea level. And so it's not that high compared to the neighboring areas. But so like this entire area where I'm going over the square, like it's on pretty high elevation. There's a ridge over here. But then in like Marika, for instance, you don't have that high of a uh, elevation. It's much lower and closer to sea level. Same thing with Novo Mykolivka to the south. And so this fortified area, this is very nice fortification, which includes a, a mound. That's where it's built around because it is higher in comparison to all of the, the proximate fields around it. And also, there's a bunch of minefields in the area. There's a bunch of trenches and dugouts. And so it is a key fortified area where you had firing positions set up. And that obviously, concrete barriers as well, which helped solidify the perimeter and really dominate the fields around here and prevent any sort of Russian column, for instance, or even Russian infantry from trying to advance along these fields towards maybe, you know, the southern flank of Marinka or towards like Pobieda from this from the east directly. 
towards some of these fields. Like you see how the main vector of attack on Pobieda has been coming in from the south, where Russia already had established positions within Marinka. It wasn't really coming in from the fields to the east. That's because of the Sijverian's fortification system, which Ukrainians really did um, fill up to the brim. And again, very difficult to attack Novomikhailivka from the east as well. Because honestly, you look at how Novomikhailivka has been at the front line for so long and how it sort of looks enveloped. You'd expect maybe Russians would be more active in attacking over here. But for the most part, they haven't been able to because of these, this Ukrainian fortification. And so really after months of trying to take it over, the Russians, the Minister, Russian Ministry of Defense actually released some footage of the taking over of that town. So I have the link to that over here. And it was probably done by Bars 11. It might have been done by some other units as well, like Chechen units that are in the area and by DPR forces. But I do know for a fact that Bars 11 is operating in the area around Marinka and to the south. And so they may have had some involvement. And Bars 11 is just a um, volunteer unit. But anyway... Um, in Marinka and in that general area, there's also something very interesting that I noticed, and that's the fact that Russia is now using T-55s and T-54s as kamikaze car bombs. And so what they do is they pack the tank with explosives, and then they just drive it into a Ukrainian position. Like, let's say if they have some dugout or some foxhole or something around a bush, they'll just completely fill up the tank with these explosives and then remotely detonate it after they like remotely control it and drive it into those positions so it's look it's basically like a car bomb in that regard and i think this is a very cheap and innovative way of utilizing russia's vast reserves of t-55s and it could prove useful especially around marinka where you know the front line has been so static there's so many trenches in this area and it's very difficult to methodically clear out each one, as we've seen for over a year. Russia's been trying to do that, and it's not been successful in many different parts of the front line. Clearly, Ukraine has been able to hold on to these positions. And so this is just one of many ways in which Russia has been forced to innovate. And believe me, Russia does have a huge stockpile of T-55s to use. And that's part of why earlier this year we saw all these videos of the trains that were shipping these T-55s. Honestly, they can't be used in combat. Uh, that's out of the question as like an actual operational tank. But this is actually a pretty creative way of using them. Instead of just throwing them out, and demol demolishing them, you could just take them out of reserves or out of storage. And Russia does have about 300 that could operationally be uh, modified and sent to the front lines for this purpose. They may have more, I read upwards of 600, but that's from 2013, those numbers. There's more recent estimates that say that they could reasonably utilize 300 tanks for this sort of operation. And so I'm leaning towards that, but still 300 tanks, that's a huge amount. And that could be extremely effective if used in one specific sector, like the one Aaron Marinka to finally push through and first of all, secure the town, but also secure nearby towns like Pobieda, secure Novomikhailivka, secure really a buffer around the ring of the Donetsk city to really reduce the amount of shelling over here, which would also require taking over Krasnohorovka, Nevelske, Provermaiske. This has been going on for over a year, and they still have not been able to do this especially because their focus has been elsewhere, like in Zaporozhia, they're not really thinking about going on the initiative elsewhere. But we do know that at the very least, they've been able to make some minor gains around the fields to the south of Marinka. That's it for Marinka, but let's go on to Bakhmut. In the Bakhmut directions, there's two things to note. First of all, the Ukrainians, they are continuing to push in the direction of Klishivko, which I found to be very interesting. And they were very close to the trenches that originally were created by the Ukrainians. And these are located on a hill, which overlooks the town of Klishivka. And so it is, first of all, a very fortified position with a ring on the perimeter. And probably being used by Russia now, it's also on the high ground compared to the other areas around it. Also overlooking some of the fields to the north that Ukraine is advancing around. And so I am interested to see how they go about 
trying to reach Kushivka. I always doubted whether they'd be able to actually do this and actually begin to penetrate the town. I still don't see how they do it directly by attacking these fortifications, especially if Russia has like a lot of positions over here and they've be really started to redesign it and remodel it after the fighting that occurred in January around Klishivka. If they did that and they prepared it for you know defensive confrontations, then I do find it difficult for Ukraine to attack the town of Klishivka and its fortifications head on. But because the Ukrainians have now secured control over all of the land to the west of the Donbass Canal, then they could also cross over in a certain area like where there's a forest and it would be hard to notice. And then in that area, they can begin to attack Klishivka from the flanks and potentially cut off the access to the fortifications in the north. And so seeing this push by the Ukrainians is very interesting. And it shows that they do still have some capabilities in that direction. They're not, they've not moved all of their men to Zaporozhye. They do have, still have some men in Bakhmut, and they are mainly attacking on the flanks, trying to maybe make some minor counterattacks and minor gains in this area. And who knows, maybe it's a part of a larger plan to try to flank Bakhmut. But at the moment, it still looks like the opposite, where you have two bulges that the Russians have that are pushing on the Ukrainian positions, like this. So they're trying to reverse that at the very least. And then in the north, they're also trying to make some gains. The Ukrainians, specifically the 225th Battalion, which is associated with the 127th Territorial Defense Brigade, which I do have mapped somewhere over here. I really hope I could find it. Yeah, it, it, it is somewhere over here, definitely. I recall moving it. There we go. The 127th and 20 Territorial Defense Brigade, it should be moved a bit to the north to around the Bovo Vasilivka because that's where it's fighting now. But this unit, and especially the battalion associated with it, they are pushing, trying to take over some of the key ridges around the Bovo Vasilivka, some of the higher ground. I'm going to do a more in-depth analysis of the situation around here because we have been seeing the Ukrainians continue to make gains to the north of Bakhmut around Rykovo Vasilivka and now pushing into Dubovo Vasilivka for the past few months and it is interesting to see what they're trying to plan over here. You can see already that Rykovo Vasilivka is under full Ukrainian control in that there is a definite push on uh, from the same direction to take over Dubovo Vasilivka and then by extension Berkivka and then also to advance along the E40 highway and some of its fields and some of the forested patches around it to try to approach the northern outskirts of Bakhmut. That's a part of Ukraine's water plan, I believe, but for now they're just making these small attacks and these small gains, chipping away at Russia's gains they made over the past half a year in this area while the Russians are uh, more busy elsewhere and while Wagner has uh, rotated their men out of the front line. So that's all I have to say for today. So thank you guys all so much for watching, and I'll see you guys in the next video. Goodbye.